we are in Haftarah Shoftim, that is Isaiah 51, uh, verse 12, all the way through 52, verse 12. I didn't fully realize something um, until recently about these seven consolations. So we're in week four, right? Um, I, I didn't, so I'm beginning to see that these consolations go far beyond comfort which comfort is necessary. But I, I'm realizing that, that these Haftaras also show us um, how redemption unfolds. So each week, as we're being comforted, we're also given an opportunity to build an understanding of you know, our state of sin and its effect on our relationship with God as we're moving toward the final redemption where the entire world rejoices, you know, in God's presence and his salvation. So in, in addition to comfort, these, I, I want you to think about these seven Haftaras um, as teaching us seven aspects of redemption. Okay. So, um, and, and they, they speak of seven hurdles in faith and, this hope in the redemption. And we need to sort of jump over these hurdles as we run the race toward redemption. Okay, so we have these seven hurdles. Now, anytime I think about the word hurdle, and I think it's appropriate here, but it, but anytime I think about the word hurdle, um, I remember back to my um, days when I was in middle school, I ran track. I mainly ran the mile relay. And so what that meant, there's, there was four of us on the team and each of us would run around the track once, right? So four times around made a mile. Um, I was, I was okay doing that um, enough that I made the traveling team and the coach seeing that I had, um, you know, that it was all right. Um, my potential was there, you know, for running this straight shot right? He asked me to try out for the, um, running the hurdles and, you know, so you run a little bit and then you jump over this, this, what, two, two and a half foot tall, um, light metal frame, something like that. Right. Well, I was horrible at it. I had a mental block and as soon as I got, I would run. And as soon as I got up to one of those things, I couldn't jump over it to save my life. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that's what I think of when I think of hurdles. Um, and Isaiah all this time has been speaking of the hurdles of our faith when it comes to the coming redemption. So the first hurdle that we've already talked about in one of the earlier weeks was this mistaken belief that God can't interfere in the forces of history. The second hurdle um, that we encountered was, was the feeling that God no longer cares to enter our story, right? And then the third hurdle, which was the one from last week, that's believing that, um, the, the hurdle of believing that, that there actually one day will be an end to war and terror. And this week, the hurdle that we have to jump over is um, the idea of the return of God's presence to Jerusalem. Because right now, it may seem like that's not ever going to happen. And then the fifth hurdle is realizing that indeed the exile is over when it's over. The sixth is rebuilding the temple and having the perception of God's presence projected out into the world. And then the seventh and final hurdle is where our relationship with God is restored and there's only joy between us. Okay. So let's talk about the, the fourth, the fourth hurdle or the fourth part. Um, this week, it's the return of God's presence to Jerusalem which results in 
the renewal of prophecy. Isaiah 52, verse 7 and 8 tells us that um, the return of God's presence to Jerusalem will bring about the return of prophecy. So God's people will be able to see God and see his role in their history and also like the greater history of mankind. They'll be able to see with greater, or we will be able to see with greater clarity. Um, and at the full redemption, the entire world will be able to realize, in fact, who has been the source of our redemption all along. So the verses are, um, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, bring good tidings, proclaim salvation, <clears throat> who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. So there's this, this midrash that says that the level of prophecy at this time will be even greater than that of Moses. So um, I, I'm going to read the, the midrash. It comes, it comes from this right here. Um, and just kind of as a review, a midrash, they're not necessarily a true story, but, but they're, they're a story usually involving a dialogue that helps us to see biblical truth. Um, so in this midrash, God said, in this world, if people see my glory, they can't survive it, as it says in Exodus 33, for no man can see me and live. But in the future, when I bring my presence back to Zion, I'll appear in my glory to all of Israel and they'll see me and live forever. As it says in Isaiah 52, every eye will see clearly, will clearly see as the Lord Hashem, it says here, returns to Zion. And so the idea of at a future time, the future redemption that Isaiah is speaking of, there's, there's a level of prophecy that's even greater than that of Moses. And that makes me think of De Deuteronomy 18.51. It says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. The ultimate fulfillment of that, of course, we know, um, is in Yeshua. And so that's one thing. Another thing. So, so there's basically th three three things I'm, I'm pulling out here for this, for this lesson. The second one... Um, in the Haftarah, there's there's another interesting place where there's a, a double. Um, remember back a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Nakamu, Nakamu, that double comfort of Isaiah. Well, in this part of Isaiah, there's there's another double, and it's um, the very first verse of the Haftarah. And it, in Hebrew, it says, Anoki, Anoki, which means I, even I, am he who comforts you. So the sages, of course, you know, they're going to have a lot of interesting things to say about what that might mean. Um, what I see is that there is a similarity in this one this week from that one from a few weeks ago. That one was comfort, comfort my people. And now we have I, even I, comfort. Okay. So this could be saying, I'm the one who comforted you in the destruction of the first temple. I'm the one who comforts you after the destruction of the second temple. Um, it could be, I'm the one who redeemed you from Babylon and I will redeem you in the greater redemption. I'm the one who comforted you. This is my favorite. I'm the one who comfort, comforted you with the first coming of Messiah. I will comfort you with the second coming. And then that double I can can be, you know, the first I was God's pronouncement at Sinai. I am the Lord your God. And the second one, the second I could be um, that future time that Isaiah is speaking of where the revelation of God in the Messianic era, um, it said it exceeds, that revelation exceeds even that at Sinai. So that's kind of cool. 
And then the last thing I wanted to point out was this idea of haste that's in this Haftarah. Um, I, well, I guess more accurately, it's lack of haste in this redemption, Isaiah's future redemption compared to the Exodus redemption. And this we get from the last verse of our Haftarah. It says, uh, but you will not leave in haste or go in flight for the Lord will go before you. The God of Israel will be your rear guard. Now, the reason I say that this is compared to the redemption out of Egypt is because of a particular word that's used here. Um, Isaiah says that the future redemption will be um, lo vahipazon. Lo means not. And the other one, the other phrase is haste. So no haste. And it's this word for haste that's used in only two other places in all of the Tanakh besides, besides here in this Haftarah. One of them is um, Exodus, and, and, and it's basically repeating the same thing. One is Exodus 12, 11. This is how you're to eat it, with your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Okay? And then Deuteronomy 16 repeats that. This is how you're to eat it, with your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, you and I probably wouldn't know that haste only occurs three times in all of the Hebrew scriptures. But someone who really, really knows their scriptures, they might know that already. The other way you might know it is if you do like I do and use either use a concordance, Strong's Concordance, the Blue Letter Bible, something like that. And then you just see, you look up that word and you see it's listed three times. That's what I did. So for someone who's paying attention and we're training ourselves to pay attention when we read scripture, right? Um, seeing no haste in the Haftarah tells us two things straight away. We're supposed to look back on the Passover story and its theme of redemption and haste. And we're supposed to contrast that with the coming, uh, the future redemption. Okay. So we're supposed to see that this future leaving is different. No haste. So does that mean it's leisurely? So is that a state of mind? Or does it carry the idea that redemption will take a while to complete? Or both, right? So where else in scripture does it talk about comparing and contrasting the Exodus redemption with the final redemption? That was the question that I asked. That seemed like the next logical place for, for me to look. Are there any other places where, where this comparison is found? And in Jeremiah 16, 14 through 15, it says, However, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. But it will be said, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, for I will restore them to the land I gave their ancestors. So Jeremiah here is saying that the ingathering of the exiles at the time of the great redemption, that will eclipse even the magnificent exodus of Egypt. Isn't that cool? So just with this little bit of a study, you, you can probably see where there's many, many different places that, that we could take it if we had the time, right? And I don't know about you, but just looking at it this week, studying just this little bit this week, it, it made me want to dig in um, in more detail about what this greater exodus really means, right? Because that's our future. So I say to you, happy studying, and I'll see you next week.